um, in, uh, in a few minutes. So first off, let me introduce uh, the session, make sure you're all in the right place. And, um, and then, of course, our panelists for today are, 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 are speakers. Um, in no particular order, I have Izumi uh, from JP Nick in Japan. Um, this is the technical community, and uh, JP Nick is uh, um, uh, the, the country registry and part of the Asia Pacific uh, region. Um, Andreas Piazov from LACNIC, uh, again the technical community. Um, LACNIC covers the uh, Latin American Caribbean uh, region for address registry. Um, joining us via WebEx um, is Peter Timish uh, from uh, Denuro and AddressX. This is the private sector. Uh, he's in the United States at the moment. Uh, and Rochelle uh, from Afrinic. Um, again, the technical community. Uh, Afrinic covers the, um, uh, well, the Africa region. We have Nick Hilliard here, again from the technical community, uh, based out of Ireland. Um, he is um, from the Internet Exchange in Dublin. And um, uh, myself, um, oh, I'm meant to be last, hold on. Um, Paul Wilson from APNIC, um, based in Australia, covers the Asia Pacific region. Um, and we're waiting um, uh, for Musaf Abdallah from the Bahrain uh, Telecommunications Regulatory Authority. Uh, he'll join us uh, later. Myself, I'm Martin Levy from Hurricane Electric, uh, based in the United States. Again, I would be marked as a technical community. So I'm just going to give a couple of really short opening slides to um, Just to, to, to put this in place, as I said, you're in workshop 144. Um, we're going to be discussing V4 markets, uh, legacy space. So I'm just going to give you a few opening comments, um, and then we'll hear from the various um, uh, panelists and speakers here. So first of all, absolute facts. AP Nick and RIPE ran out of space on dates in 2011 and 2012. However, we're not out of IPv4 space. There is still this reserved set. Um, we'll hear about this further as the speakers um, discuss this. Aaron, for example, went through a stage one, stage two, and then a stage three process, which adjusted and, and controlled how the members could allocate additional space, making uh, requirements a little tighter, but simply changing this. This is, again, all highly documented. The actual numbers for true exhaustion dates in the future are, are estimates. You can calculate them as best you can, but they're still based upon how the community, how the members of the RIRs do allocations. Um, this is today's listing from um, uh, from um, uh, Jeff Wilson's, uh, Jeff Houston's uh, site, I'm going the wrong way, um, and um, it shows projected dates for the future for the other three RIRs. But what are we really talking about here? Potentially legacy space, potentially the value. This was some <clears throat> quite amazing press from about a year ago. Uh, from the UK, one billion pounds worth of address space available. Well, we'll hear about that maybe. <clears throat> Finally, and I show this occasionally to, to realize this, if you go way back, you will see something well before there was any policy about selling, about moving, about transferring, about any of these words that you hear. This was an eBay bid that got removed but it simply started the conversation about transfer policy that, that you'll hear about today. So these are just a few things for uh, everything to, uh, uh, to start the conversation. I will now leave the stage and moderate from uh, the floor, and I will hand it over um, to Azumi for the first presentation. 
I'll just find the right one. Hold on. I'm Izumi Okutani and I'm from um, Internet Registry in Japan, an organization that distributes and um, manages IP address. And I'd like to share what are the two approaches that um, you know, we can take in um, solving this, um, trying to addressing this uh, V4 um, address pool exhaustion issue. And there are two points that I'd like to share. One is that um, address policies, how we distribute V4 address space, um, these are discussed in what's called address policy forums of the RIRs, and anybody is able to participate. And also, um, well, there has been quite a lot of interest and discussions about IPv4 transfers and how we can redistribute unused IPv4 address space. But um, if we think about it, IPv6, which is another version of IP address, um, deploying this, um, uh, having the networks to deploy this IP version 6 will be more of the long-term solution to the issues. And this is something that needs much wider collaboration by our stakeholders. So firstly, to introduce about address policy forums, there are five address policy forums um, in the world that is operated by the regional internet registries. And uh, it's based in bottom-up, transparent, um, and open process. <laughs> so, um, Anybody here in the room is um, able to join the discussion. So, of course, um, you, I think for your input to be useful for the community, um, it would, it's important that you follow what are the dis discussions are and the issues are. But you can follow this uh, on the archive of the mailing list, the presentations that are posted on the website. So there's equal opportunity to everybody to participate. And um, this discussions on addressing the issue of before um, address exhaustion has been discussed in various regions of these RIRs, starting from around year 2007, a couple of years before the first internet registry had um, this uh, IPv4 address space exhausted in year 2011. So um, today we have uh, four out of uh, five internet registries adopting our IPv4 transfer policies. So uh, I think uh, RIRs, except Afrinic region, has adopted our uh, transfer policy. The idea is that um, if you have people with with already IPv4 address have unused space that you're not using, um, this transfer policy allows you to uh, distribute or transfer this space to those who need it. And um, currently, the default is that um, it's basically transfer within the um, RIR region. So the region that are marked in the same colors, you can transfer the space within these regions. So if somebody in the Latin American region has a, uh, a new space that they can distribute, they can distribute this space to another organization within the Latinic region. But the um, issue that we want to consider um, once the address space has exhausted is that um, depending on the region, the address space available that is unused um, is different depending on the region. So it is considered that the North American Aaron region has the most uh, space that is available and unused and can be redistributed. So to have more equal opportunity for any of the organizations to receive this um, unused space, IPv4 address space, um, here comes inter-regional, inter-RIR transfer policy. And this allows um, transfers to happen across the uh, registries. So currently today, the APNIC, um, the Asia-Pacific uh, 
registry and airing the North American and I think parts of the Caribbean uh, registries, they have adopted inter-registry transfer policy. So it's possible to do the transfer between these regions. And uh, regarding the other regions, the right CC lack link, I think uh, it, this policy is still not adopted. So at this stage, it's partially like uh, cross-regional transfers are possible. But uh, it's not fully, um, it can't just uh, transfer to any part of the world. So this is something that might be a remaining issue that we might want to consider. But um, further point that I want to make is that um, IPv4 address space is finite in its nature. So the total V6 space is 4.3 billion, which is less than the world population. And um, the space that's available to be redistributed is li even more limited. So um, supposing that you were able to redistribute 20% of a new space, um, this is actually an equivalent to about, about maybe four or five years of consumption rate at the time of um, 2011, when the first internet registry had this space um, um, exhausted. So this is not really um, going to solve the long-term solution, even though you come up with the most efficient policy to redistribute IPv4 address space. So this is where um, IPv6 uh, deployment comes in. And the current issue today is that um, you're still able to receive additional um, IPv4 address space, which is another version, and we don't have to worry about the exhaustion. So people can still continue receiving v6 from the internet registries. But v4 and v6 networks are not compatible. So even you have if you happen to have v6 space but not v4, then you're not able to communicate with networks that is only um, speaking in um, IPv4 language, and which is the majority of the internet. So v6 only users are not likely to be able to browse websites that only support IPv4 or not able to send emails or have other forms of communications that only support v4. So it really limits them in the kind of communications that they can do on the internet If today if you only have IPv6 address. So, and this is an area that needs much wider stakeholder involvement because you need all these uh, V4 networks, which is, you know, um, literally all the existing networks on the internet to start supporting IPv6. And, and this is called dual stack to be able to speak both IPv4 and IPv6. And I'd like to uh, share the case of Japan. And uh, we have all these different industry bodies within Japan. Like uh, we have like a research group called Wide Project, or we have like a network operators group called um, JANO. And we have all these groups are uh, working on this issue. But we felt that uh, all these groups getting together and comprehensively uh, trying to deal with this issue might help. So a task force to address this issue on IPv4 address exhaustion was set up in 2008. And government ministries, or the MIC, the Ministry for um, Internal Affairs and Communications, they're actually being a member of this task force as well. And the idea behind it is, let's think of what can be done as the whole economy is Japan and um, have this um, issue to be widely um, outreached but at the same time individually to these uh, members of our different stakeholders of these individual organizations. So that's an idea behind it. And another thing that I'd like to share is um, how the government is, the Japanese government is involved in taking this initiative. Um, I think the community in Japan is very much driven by the private sectors, but what the government is doing is set up this study group that gathers experts from private sectors and academia as well. And they regularly get together and what are the common issues that needs to be discussed. And they have broke our, our produced progress report three times. So that helps you keep track of what are the issues that have been solved from the last progress report and what are the remaining issues that we should consider as a whole community. And this also helps certain stakeholder groups trying to address an issue that you can't uh, solve within your expertise and would like to request for another stakeholder groups to um, address this issue. And there are a couple of cases that has helped um, address problems of internet service providers providing access connections 
organizations not able to uh, provide good connections to home users because some of the issues about the equipment. And this kind of forum helped, helped um, address this issue because this, there was somebody who could help in this area of uh, resolving technical things about V6 equipment. So that's the kind of forum that we have in, J in Japan and that's happening. And, um, but that's just one economy in the Asia Pacific region and I think there are lots of um, other approaches that um, a regional, um, as the Asia Pacific region is doing. For example, there's APIPV6 task force showing what's happening in the, uh, each of the economies in the Asia Pacific region and uh, I think each of the regional internet registries. I think that they all have this IPv6 dedicated website sharing case studies measurement, trainings, and things like that. This worldwide effort that's called our World IPv6 launch that has set a target date to start on um, commercial service on IPv6 on different um, um, levels like uh, internet service providers, content providers, um, and also vendors to start on um, IPv6 um, um, commercial service. So these are the things that are happening um, globally. But um, I feel that we need much wider stakeholder involvement in order for the uh, contents, the websites available in IPv6 just in the same way that IPv4 users are able to use and mobile phone providers. That's another area that we need to work on and that's um, starting to be, you know, have a large proportion of the internet um, uh, connectivity and I think that's something that I'd like to uh, discuss about the effective ways on getting all these stakeholders um, involved um, to um, help with IPv6 deployment in this session. Thanks, that's all for me. Thank you, Izumi. <clears throat> you brought up, of course, IPv6 as one of the uh, one of the issues to discuss here and uh, compatibility. Um, Andreas from LACNIC, um, do you want to give us uh, an opening? I, Izumi only was the only person with slides. I gave her extra time because of that, and uh, I'll. Uh, make sure that we uh, we get through this full list here. So, uh, uh, Andreas. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Andres Piazza. I'm uh, representing LACNIC and having the honor of replacing Arturo Servin that was originally on this panel, our CTO. Um, our situation, this is why it wasn't that useful for us uh, to bring uh, data in, in, in slides because we have a uh, different situation compared to at least APNIC and RIPNC, uh, ARIN and RIPNCC. Uh, our region hasn't re registered uh, yet significant amounts of uh, movements in the IP, IPv4 market uh, transactions. Actually, uh, in what uh, LACNIC refers uh, specifically, we haven't uh, registered, uh, we haven't uh, we have no uh, knowledge about any, uh, not, not a single one, uh, transaction or operation of transfers uh, or, or IPv4 secondary market. So our situation is more like a, a kind of uh, expectation and uh, trying to analyze the situation and how the evolution should be and the challenges that uh, will be faced, we will face uh, mainly in 2014. Uh, there are some reasons that uh, could uh, justify the, the situation. LACNIC also does not have any policy yet. There has been discussions, as Isumi uh, also mentioned, in our region uh, since many years uh, from now, but uh, specifically in the last two years. But um, LACNIC has no uh, has no policy, and uh, I guess the LAC policy forum will be. The, 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 last poly, the, the next policy forum will be taking place next week in our annual meeting in Curaçao. Um, and I guess uh, there's no there's a significant focus in this matter of secondary markets or uh, IPv4 markets. The, the focus is still more of the policy forum in the IPv4 exhaustion situation, which is uh, our current uh, main challenge. I, like Nick, uh, according to the projections, uh, different projections, but we can say uh, most uh, we, with some certainty that 
if this keeps in this in this uh, rhythm, uh, Lagnik will uh, enter into a, a soft landing phase uh, and will be exhausting his uh, IPv4 uh, pool in May next year, 2014. So, uh, in a relative uh, situation, this is a, we have an advantage compared with some other areas that uh, exhausted their pools of IPv4, or not exhausted uh, completely, but uh, that entered in the soft landing um, policies uh, in 2011, and our, our situation is uh, much more comfortable, if we have to say that, but we are not uh, resting with the, the this uh, benefit of having some uh, a better situation. We, we have been developing a lot of efforts, uh, mainly uh, related to IPv6. Our analysis is that um, there has, uh, Lagnik region is one of the regions that is growing the most, maybe after uh, APNIC region would be, could be probably the second region that uh, the network uh, is developing, is growing the most, and uh, there, the, the challenges we face, and we understand that, the, that we need to, to address some responses to those challenges uh, are uh, mostly related to, to the, uh, the difference between the addresses that the IPv4 addresses that are being uh, added in the in the supply each year, each year by the RERs to the market to the different operators compared with the the new dispositives that had that have been added uh, there is a an article that uh, Jobs Houston from APNIC published uh, a couple of months ago and uh, they uh, there was uh, one specific uh, data that uh, has to be mentioned. Uh, he he, he um, mentions the, that 42 million addresses have been introduced uh, as part of the supply of addresses to the market in the nine, first, first nine months of the 2003 year. And in the same period, 300 million ad, uh, dispositives have been introduced uh, to, the, to the network. So uh, the, the situation, the, the balance uh, of new addresses and uh, lack of uh, efficiency in the uh, in, in how the the pool is uh, being uh, administrated uh, in, in the early 90s. He he in the same in the same article he mentioned that uh, it was an acceptable rate of 10% of addresses. If you if you if you locate 100 addresses and 10 were actually used, it was an acceptable rate, and, and now uh, the, the rate is more around 50 and 75 percent, and there's also, a, a statistically speaking, a really, uh, it's not a good situation to, to have so little information in order not to know whether if the, 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 the percentage is 50 or 75, because the gap is enormous, is is. Uh, uh, and, and it shouldn't be should be statistically unacceptable. But the issue is that it's very hard for the areas at least uh, to know that uh, how is the the space being allocated uh, if there is a NAT and especially carrier grade NAT and how uh, these addresses are being uh, used effectively. But um, the the possibility of increasing the effectiveness of this this uh, uses or use of addresses. Is one of the focus, but the, the main focus uh, for us is, of course, IPv6. Uh, we have some. Uh, in 2014, the advantage for us, uh, compared to what APNIC had to face three years or two years ago, uh, is that uh, mostly in these two three years, uh, there was a significant uh, move forward regarding the availability of content in IPv6, uh, and this uh, situation uh, makes us to have some advantages, and for example, last uh, couple of months, uh, you can see that the, the traffic of uh, IP, the percentage of uh, IPv6 traffic compared to the total traffic in the region could be uh, changed or modified uh, significantly with one or two operators having one or two actions uh, de deploying in the final, uh, in, the, in the last mile, in the uh, when to the final user uh, IPv6 and if they do that one operator in Peru did that and, and the graphic moved uh, significantly so for us uh, we are more focused in trying to uh, 
uh, having the, the, the first hundred, the, the top two categories of our operators in our region to try to develop, to deploy IPv6 in the final user. And if we do that, the IPv4 markets wouldn't be a phenomenon that would be uh, so significant for the lagging region at least. On the other hand, uh, so we, maybe this would sound uh, too optimistic, but uh, we, we think that we can uh, pro provide a significant transition to IPv6 before uh, the, the supply channels of IP before are, are exhausted because we also have this soft landing period in our policies. Um, regarding other uh, uh, other other issues that uh, for us are important to consider in order not, not to avoid deploying this, to avoid taking these uh, policies of transfer, transfer but uh, to consider if the policies are uh, effectively be discussing the policy forums and adopted by the community is that um, the, the allocation of IP, IP, IPv4 addresses or IPv6 addresses directly by the RAR to the uh, members, to its members, has a, um, advantage, a much more important advantage regarding, for example, the, the who is, the usage of the who is. Uh, in uh, incidents responses, in, in cyber security, in law enforcement issues, and uh, the, the transfer policies. If we do that, we have to be very careful in order to, for example, to, to take, take into account this added value that uh, who is a database could also provide for the, for the region. So it is not, not only the uh, availability of addresses uh, as the one single dimension that for us we, we face in this in this issue. So uh, may this, this uh, perspective from the Lagnic region may sound uh, a little bit different than the rest of the regions and, and maybe a, a more optimistic, uh, maybe some, maybe a little naive could be, could sound also, I don't know, I hope it doesn't sound this way because in our, in our head uh, we are really confident that we can deploy p 6 uh, and make this uh, some abstract problem that uh, it's just uh, in some one or two years, uh, 2014 and 15, for example, uh, and, and then the market could uh, could be just uh, the policy could be just uh, no, not not use it anymore. So, for us, uh, this is our current uh, take on on this problem, and I hope we can develop as we think we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's interesting to note that you talk about just one or two operators um, can make the difference in V6 traffic with inside the region. Um, again, that's very pleasing to hear. Um, Anne Rochelle um, from Afrinic will be next, and um, we uh, we will continue with this uh, we'll continue with this discussion. Thank you. And actually, if I may make a comment, um, the. Transcribers would like stronger audio. I think that's okay to ask of you, Anne, is it? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Good morning, everybody. My name is Anne Rochelle Ine, and I'm from Afrinic. Um, so as you seen from, um, you saw from uh, one of the slides that Martin showed from the beginning, Afrinic is uh, the registry that right now has uh, uh, the biggest pool of uh, IPv4 addresses left. We have about 3.5 uh, slash 8 left. Um, so um, there is a little bit, we are starting to feel a little bit of pressure from the exhaustion of the same space in other uh, regions. I'll talk more about that. Uh, and uh, before that, what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit uh, on what we're doing to let's say, alleviate uh, uh, that fact in our region. Uh, we don't, we are the youngest registry. We have um, about uh, 1,200 members. We have, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, a very good, uh, you know, pretty good news because in our region right now, um, the one pool of people who are really interested in IPv6 are the governments which is great, 
because um, if they do that, we are really uh, hoping and uh, seeing in other places where uh, governments have started being interested in asking us to help them, for example, you know, design uh, 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 V6 plans, transition from V4 to V6 to uh, their own networks, others are starting to feel, oh, okay, well, if they're doing it, maybe we, will, we should start thinking about it. And uh, AFRINIC has been doing for the past uh, few years quite a lot of training, uh, both in V4 and in V6. Um, as Izumi said, one of the things that we see is um, uh, so the pickup of dual stacking and um, hopefully doing away with naps that were something that that are still something that are plaguing the region, really, uh, networks in the region. And that is also because uh, being the, the youngest RIR, you know, for, uh, because the region had been served by um, uh, other entities for the longest time, people thought we could not have IP addresses, so, you know, they went away and uh, basically used NAT a lot. So now we're trying to, you know, help them a lot. Uh, we do a lot of hand-holding uh, during the trainings, after the trainings, and uh, our registration service people are really having a, a, a lot of work, you know, in helping people uh, uh, do away with knots. So that's uh, some of the things that we're doing. Um, registration service is also seeing, for example, a lot of requests now uh, from uh, um, legacy space holders uh, who have uh, who are mostly universities in certain uh, located in uh, you know South Africa mostly um, who are now uh, requesting that Afrinic for example and some individual holders we do have individual holders legacy holders legacy space holders in the region who are asking Afrinic to help them. Uh, in transfers. So we're talking to them right now and uh, we're trying to put a process together so we can uh, uh, help them do that because I think it will be in the interest of everybody that uh, that space is, uh, you know, brought back to uh, uh, the, the pool that is seen by everybody. Um, so, so some other, um, one other thing that uh, has not gotten traction really in our region is the uh, the transfer policy. There is one that is being discussed and that has been discussed for the past year in the region, but uh, basically um, it kind of comes and goes. There are moments when people are thinking, well, yeah, why not? Let's do it. And um, um, Oftentimes, we end up not advancing on the policy because a lot of people do not want to transfer policy. There is another policy that um, uh, uh, two people from the region have put forward that is about um, uh, V4 for uh, uh, academic networks. And this is all in the spirit of making sure that we do away with the IPv4 space in the region and use IPv6 finally uh, on the networks. Um, another thing that uh, we are seeing is uh, now that some other regions have, um, uh, you know, exhausted uh, their pool or their biggest uh, part of the V4 space. We see people coming in our region, for example, establishing business so they can get, uh, you know, V4 addresses. And um, just to make you laugh, I am going to read you something that um, I received yesterday that says, we are contacting you to participate in the standard bid for the lease or sale of your 196.1.0.0 IPv4 address space. As you know, IPv4 is in the transitional period and we will soon and will soon be replaced by IPv6. We are interested in leasing 
or acquiring your IPv4 address space for cash dollars before they become obsolete. So this is one of the things that we receive a lot in the Africanic region right now. So um, I think I'm going to stop here. I gave you a little bit of the you know space where we where we sit mostly. So here we're we're, we're really debating what the, the markets are and legacy space and and how we're trying to alleviate that is really by pushing for IP as much as we can in the region. And uh, ours being a young region, people are, uh, you know, uh, willing to take it up. But at the same time, the fact that IPv6 hasn't been picking up internationally too much is not helping us either. So dual stacking is for the moment the way to go. And uh, we're not too sure where this whole discussion in the community is going to lead us, given that other, uh, some are saying, give up the space, others are saying, keep it. Um, so policies are uh, being tabled. Um, you know, our next meeting is going to be in November in Cote d'Ivoire, and we know for sure that the policy on V4 for academic network, for example, is one that is going to be debated a lot, and uh, the transfer one is coming back on the table. So one more that we will talk about a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, quite a different view from uh, the Afrinic uh, region uh, because of those dates. Um, um, Next uh, uh, participant and speaker is Peter Timish uh, from Denua Addressex. Uh, he's in the United States. He'll be joining us remotely. Uh, Peter, um, the audio should be perfect, so please go ahead. And uh, we we'll try and keep everybody nice and short, but uh, I, I think we're, we're doing good for time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Martin. Good morning. My name is Peter Timish, and it's a pleasure to speak this important workshop at the Internet Governance Forum. I represent Abbott's Inc., <clears throat> a marketplace for network operators to procure the right to IP space. We focus only on the early registration of IP space, also known as the legacy number, issued around 1983 to 1997, directed many companies around the world that were unused and fallow because they no longer need them. It's not always this way. Many of the early holders set up their own networks and managed to get online. But the advent of business internet service providers, these companies no longer need to maintain their own network infrastructure. In terms of business ISPs, these companies no longer use the space given them. This is typical about 1995. Institutional knowledge is lost in years, and so many of these companies no longer even know they have these network blocks. What type of companies are these? They're hospitals, local governments, grocery store chains, and the like. None are in the internet services business, and none are aware of the regional app registries. These blocks sit frozen in time. This is the supply that awaits a transfer market. Due to every growing demand for new services with a myriad of devices, internet service companies must have additional space to grow. And due to dual stack, they have to have both IPv4 and IPv6 for the foreseeable future. So we invite network operators to become marketplace participants. We will provide access credentials to a closed online platform which permits various IP space for sale held by the holders of rights. We are not brokers per se. Once an operator becomes a marketplace participant, we now call them, press them to buy. None of the RRs would call them and ask, we need additional space today? And neither do we. Addicts, in short, is a replacement source supply for regional richer that no longer meets the demand of members for additional space. We invested millions of U.S. dollars identifying, locating, and listing early registration space that has gone unused for decades. The total size of unused space held by these early registrants is vast and significant. We currently have over hundreds of network operators and learning companies that have become average marketplace businesses worldwide. The majority are in ripe NCC LIRs. Surprisingly to many, Abrex sees only a single region as being a functional market today, Europe, which is serviced by ripe NCC. Why so? In reverse order, Afrinet, still in its immense inventory of available space to contract the region members, we estimate the ability to meet demand will continue until at least exhaustion of 2022. And the same with LACNIC, which means they the large inventory as well. We estimate they will exhaust. 2015 really for us 
We think more like 2017. Well, Aaron maintains over 29 million numbers from 2040 to contract this region to the last until early 2015. That means the two regional rate chiefs have decided to only contract a single slash 22, which is a very small block, to each its new or existing number from where I have. 18 acres unable as of April 14, 2011, to contract additional states with members. That does not mean that the reach network operators are out of additional states in that date, though. The run to exhaustion in 18 acres was generated by huge requests by network operators. Many of them hold very large stockpiles of unused member blocks who are corporate inventory. Many Asia Pack operators have requested information on how the marketplace works. They're still holding vast quantities of unused space, so they're not participating as of yet. The right NCC region is the sole region that has a vibrant and easy to navigate market as of today. Right has many the same policies in place as down in APA. It's how they choose to apply those policies that is unique. Right only applies its policies to contracted space. It does not believe that it has a right to enforce its policies on early registration holders. Instead, right encourages the holders of the right to early registration, also from right to states, to update the registry upon transfer of rights to another business entity so as to maintain an accurate registry. We have managed a great number of transfers of rights to early registration states maintained in the right NCC database as of today. So how many, how large is the early registration holdings in right NCC? Currently, there's over 197 million numbers so designated in the right database. Average believes, and we spent a lot of money and effort to determine this, there's about 991 full class B records, known as slash 16, and three parts that are unused and foul. That is 64.9 million numbers. We currently maintain a list of about 90 plus class B slash 16 rows to banker to network operators. All these holdings are maintained in the right into the registry and are not subject to the proposed inter RR transfer policy that have floated around. As I said earlier, our goal is to be source supply for years to come. We propose that right NCC be sort of a key tree dish for how registration, early registration, should be created by an RR. Since none of the other regions will develop a true market for next year, we propose that we take some deep breath and see what happens in their region. If speculators and orders and other such words are banded around suddenly snatch vast holdings in the early regulation, then there is the proof for naysayers. But if not, we've been doing this for over a year now, and none of that behavior has been in sight, then maybe there is no air there. And we can remove the artificial barriers placed in other regions. So that's why I believe it's important that we participate in a discussion like this, because this discussion is about markets and transfers of IPv4 states. And while we can all talk about IPv6, which is a wonderful idea, the concept is, is that if there was not a market that was clean and easy to use, what would be the answer? Because today, in our protocol version 4, originally known as the DOD Internet Protocol Standard, it is still the primary source for people to get online with. And so I propose in this whole group, in this workshop, we need to stop talking about IPv6 so much and figure out how to make them both coexist. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And um, you actually just, you, you touched on one subject that, that should be, um, just, just re-mentioned, you talked about accuracy of, um, of the registries when you talked about one of the focuses within RIPE. That's, a, I know, a focus with inside all of the uh, RIRs, but that, uh, that accuracy of registry is something that is uh, very important as we see uh, IP addresses uh, move around. Um, I'm going to call on Nick Hilliard um, uh, out of uh, INEX in Dublin uh, to, uh, to speak next. And uh, Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Nick Hilliard, um, and I'm CTO of uh, INEX, which is the Internet Exchange in Dublin. Um, it might seem a little bit strange uh, to have um, uh, uh, an IXP representative up here. In fact, I'm quite heavily involved in the uh, right addressing policy, um, and have been active in that area for several years. Um, 
I actually want to pick up uh, where um, uh, the last speaker um, uh, finished off in terms of talking about uh, um, uh, uh, Internet Address uh, Registry uh, data integrity because I think this is actually critical to dealing with the um, entire issue of, uh, of the legacy address space pool. Now, several years ago in the ripe region, um, we introduced uh, a policy to clean up the registry of uh, certain types of address space that had been assigned to, uh, to end users. Um, and uh, there, there was approximately um, about uh, 16 or 17 years worth of assignments which hadn't been tracked uh, terribly carefully, uh, probably about 25 or 30,000 30, in all. Um, we're still dealing with that problem, or at least when I say we, the RIPE NCC is still dealing with this problem. Um, they've got it about two thirds, or at least three quarters uh, handled at this stage. Um, and at this stage, they are dealing with a, uh, a very small uh, number of people who are very hard to get in contact, simply because the majority of these people don't know they hold the address space or um, uh, they, they no longer exist or, or, or whatever. Um, and this provides a very interesting data point uh, in terms of dealing with the uh, legacy address space uh, issue. Um, there is an awful lot of legacy address space um, uh, registered in the RIPE uh, NCC database, probably about the equivalent of four slash eights, um, which uh, is um, a couple of percent of the, uh, the entire uh, uh, addressing pool. Um, there is actually no policy uh, to handle this address space at the moment, and the RIPE NCC uh, feels that it does not have uh, any policy basis to um, uh, make pronouncements about uh, about the address space. However, they are a registry, um, and it uh, uh, it takes time and resources and money to uh, to run a registry. And if there's a a very large block of um, users who are using this registry, um, then it makes uh, sense for the RIPE NCC to um, uh, to, to put in place a uh, 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 policy to, uh, to, 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 to handle the, uh, uh, the address blocks. Um, the, pro the primary uh, uh, um, intent of this policy um, is to uh, ensure data correctness, um, because this is what a, a, an address registry is. If we don't have data correctness, then we don't have anything. Um, and in particular, if we don't have data correctness, uh, if, if we don't actually know who the address space is correctly registered to, then this makes uh, the uh, issue of handling the uh, legacy address space uh, transfers incredibly difficult uh, because it means that um, uh, if there's no uh, um, uh, due diligence done on the uh, holders, uh, then there's no guarantee that the uh, transfer has been done correctly um, and there's no guarantee uh, to the new holders that they actually have any legitimate right to use this address space. You can probably see that this is actually quite a serious problem. Um, in addition to this, uh, the uh, RIPE um, uh, NCC has uh, been offering various carrots in front that, uh, uh, to, to the legacy address holders that if, if the policy goes through, there will be various other uh, services available. One of these would be RPKI, uh, which is a, a resource uh, certification system. Um, so um, the difficulty um, uh, faced in the, uh, uh, I think, in the RIPE uh, uh, service area and, uh, uh, in fact, throughout the rest of the world um, is um, to uh, ensure uh, that the address transfers that happened uh, uh, and that happened in the future are handled in such a way that the registry data is kept up to date because um, uh, because if we don't have correct registry data, we're, uh, uh, we're dead in the water. Um, in terms of uh, the scale of this problem, uh, there, there's a figure mentioned of 35% of uh, the available address space uh, being assigned to legacy users. That's a slightly uh, um, misleading figure. Um, there are quite a few uh, uh, single entities who would hold quite a lot of address space. For example, the US Department of Defense 
uh, has the equivalent of uh, uh, over 12 slash 8, which is about 5.5% of the entire address space uh, on the planet. Um, about 25% is assigned to the uh, uh, regional internet address uh, registries, much of which um, uh, still rests with, uh, with Aaron. And the majority of that address space is assigned to uh, uh, early address holders in the academic uh, uh, arena. So, in fact, the, uh, the address space uh, pool that we're talking about, uh, while it isn't 35%, uh, it's certainly uh, a very large uh, number of address space uh, or a very large uh, quantity of address space, and um, uh, the um, uh, the uh, opportunity that this provides to uh, uh, to uh, provide liquidity into a future address market, I think, is going to be very important. Um, very briefly, I want to talk about uh, uh, some of the current uh, uh, right policies. Uh, we have a new uh, uh, policy proposal um, for uh, handling. Uh, uh, regular uh, ripe internet uh, uh, addresses um, called post depletion reality adjustment and cleanup, um, which we hope will be uh, uh, become a policy fairly shortly. This policy removes the requirement for an assignee to justify their use of the IPv4 address space that they're requesting. And it's a pretty dramatic move away from uh, all previous policies, which required you to state. Uh, um, to state a need for the address space uh, that you are looking for. And uh, it's essentially uh, an almost complete deregulation uh, of the internet uh, addressing uh, markets um, in the right service region. The reason that this, is, uh, uh, that this has come into uh, play is because the, the right uh, uh, community has realized that uh, uh, the addressing market is reality. Um, there's nothing bad about having an addressing market. It provides a very efficient means of transferring uh, addresses uh, from one party to the next. Uh, previously, we did uh, assignment on the basis uh, of stated need, but because we don't have any more uh, address uh, space in the RIPE uh, uh, data pool, or at least uh, very small quantities left, uh, the, this mechanism no longer works. And we need to uh, wake up to the reality that uh, that a market-based uh, uh, address transfer regime is going to be the uh, new reality for um, uh, address assignment throughout the world. Um, this also, of course, uh, feeds into the, uh, the uh, legacy address uh, situation by giving us uh, legitimacy. Um, so that's pretty much all I want to say. Um, now I hand it over to Martin again. Thank you very much. Yes, this. Uh Change of last policy is, uh, I think, quite unique within the RIR world. Our final comments from the stage here will be from Paul Wilson from the AP NIC region. Um, and then I will, uh, um, after that, open it up for any additional questions from the, uh, from the stage and then uh, obviously to uh, everybody here in the room and anybody remotely. Uh, Paul, if you would, please. Thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, Paul Wilson from, from APNIC, the IP address registry for Asia Pacific. Um, I, I actually don't want to get in between the panelists who've spoken and the, and the question time. There are a lot of um, issues here that could be discussed, and I think I'd, I'd be very interested to hear what questions uh, exist in the audience, because we could spend a our time here talking about motivations for transfers, our experience uh, with um, transfers, our experience with exhaustion, you know, what are the, what's the current status and activity levels in transfers which are going on today? There are a few controversial sort of issues as well or questions that you'll have different, different answers for. Um, market prices and what brokers are doing in the, in the environment now. Uh, there's an issue being raised about leasing of addresses as opposed to a, 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 a once and for all transfer. There are questions about the relationship between transfers and uh, and the transition to IPv6 and the vice versa, the the effect of the transition to IPv6 on the on the transfer market. Uh, we've heard about legacy addresses, uh, which have different uh, views depending on where you're coming from. We've heard also about the issue of demonstrated need uh, being part of a transfer policy, um, which is also um, an important one at the moment. Um, 
I do think we all, uh, to have a meaningful discussion, also need to base it on facts, and I think there are a few uh, misunderstandings about exactly exactly what the facts are behind uh, many of these many of these questions. But just having said that, um, you could see this. I've got many things in my mind, and rather than spending more time talking, very interested to um, to hear questions and discussion. Thanks. Hope that's okay, Mark. That's perfectly okay. That gives us some extra time, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so. There were some interesting little nuggets that were mentioned. And one of the key things that you would have noticed if you were listening was the difference between the different regions, the different mindsets. So I'm going to hit quickly um, some questions based upon what was said. Um, and Michelle, I'm going to start with you out of, uh, out of the Afrinic, and that's the Africa region. Um, you're both the newest registry, but you are also from the various projections, if I use Jeff Houston's, um, the registry that's going to have the uh, longest uh, amount of time before running out of V4 space. But you said there's a discussion internally to say, should we give some up or keep it? Keeping it, we can understand. Giving up, where does it go? When you say give up some IP space, where would your region um, transfer or, or send back those IP addresses? What would happen if that, if that was your member's request? Could you talk a little bit about this? So I suspect that given the fact that the community has not been very keen on having um, or putting together um, needs-based transfer policy together. Um, there have been some ramblings about, given that we are seeing people from other regions coming to actually ask for um, big space, you know, uh, from Afrinic, maybe Afrinic should put together um, some special pricing for those people to do away with, uh, with the space. So um, these are talks that have been um, uh, seriously, I mean, uh, comments that have come from the floor, comments that have been made on lists, and um, uh, I'm not too sure if it's uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek or not, or if, you know, uh, some people are really thinking that, you know, this is the way uh, we should do away with the space. But the other thing that has gotten quite some traction is the one policy whereby people are um, want to give the space basically to uh, education networks. That is the one thing that has somewhat, let's say, with um, the help of AFRIN, the African Research and Education Networks community, who are all interested because they have uh, uh, as members all the universities and higher education institutions on the, in the region as members. Uh, they were very much in favor of having that policy pass and there was a very heated discussion at uh, the latest meeting in Lusaka. Um, even though the chairs of the PDP working group uh, decided that there was no consensus and they put the policy back on discussion. But this is one that is, I think, having the most traction. So basically allow education institutions to ask for um, uh, 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 the space. Uh, for um, given that we give them lesser pricing already, let's say preferential rates, you know, so that everybody, each one of them can get space and do away with, uh, uh, of course, the NAPs. You have to understand that, um, you know, um, in the region, because universities were traditionally where internet started, you know, this is where we have um, the most networks, you know, also. So, of course, if they were to come together and ask for, um, uh, you know, uh, big chunks of, uh, of space, uh, that could actually help the, um, uh, let's say, depletion date come really uh, much earlier than, for example, just predicted. 
understand. Yes, predictions are only as good as we know today, and things can change. Um, the uh, acronym we used, PDP, Policy Development Process, uh, a member-based uh, environment that all the RIRs use for their, um, um, from their members to, um, uh, to decide how to move forward. I'm going to hit the opposite of, of this. Izumi, um, in, in, in Japan, as in the rest of Asia Pacific, you, you are dealing with the opposite. You, the exhaustion exists both uh, in your case at the, uh, the national level, but also within the region, um, within the APNIC region, um, you're in a whole different uh, space. So is the operator community, how, how is the operator community reacting now, um, knowing full well that there is no more IPv4 space? Is, is, are they going to the markets? Are they truly, um, are they implementing carrier grade NAT? Are they wholeheartedly moving forward to IPv6? And um, what is their sort of exact position today? Um, I think um, they are trying to um, address it in multiple ways. So they accept the reality that today, IPv4 connectivity is the majority, so it's not realistic for everybody to fully just only support IPv6. So there are some transfer activities happening within Japan, so operators with who need um, additional like address space for expansions for customers, they actually st uh, try to um, get more space through transfer mechanism. But at the same time, they feel that uh, it's just not enough to um, as I mentioned, it's just not going to be a long-term solution to the problem. So most of the major operators are uh, make sure that they support uh, V6 in addition to V4, and um, so that's something that's happening. And so I think um, according to the ratio of the number of um, network, um, I think over 70% of the ISPs support IPv6 in addition to IPv4. So we're working in both ways. It doesn't mean that we think you know, v6 is really going to happen uh, in the near future, but you know, making sure that we are prepared for the situation. And then in parallel, uh, getting, trying to get hold of IPv4. And, um, and the big issue that we're facing is um, to get more content providers to support our, um, providing IPv6 in the mobile phone. Um, our providers are start pro are providing IPv6, and that's an area that we're str struggling a little bit um, in this effort. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one quick final question and then open it up to the floor. Um, Nick, could you give us a quick review of um, uh, as the right region has just finished uh, its uh, meeting not a week ago on the inter-RIR transfer and the difference between where right members are thinking and the rest of the, uh, uh, the other RIRs around the world. And just, I'll ask you to be brief, but, but to the point. Uh, this is an interesting point. Um, the, uh, there are uh, policies uh, to transfer address spaces between uh, RIRs uh, which have compatible uh, um, address assignment policies. But because the RIPE NCC is branching out into this new area where we're dropping the requirement uh, for stated uh, needs uh, uh, assignment, then all of a sudden, uh, the RIPE uh, NCC is going to find itself uh, out on its own. And this is going to be an, an interesting situation as to whether the rest of the world is going to change their policies to match the RIPE NCCs or whether the RIPE NCC is going to stay uh, uh, in this uh, island. So we don't quite know what's going to happen. Thank you. Uh, Paul, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, just uh, to fill in a bit of history, uh, APNIC implemented a transfer policy many years ago, some years before the exhaustion of our IPv4 space, with the, on the assumption, I think, within the community that um, we had the opportunity to make transfers available, to try them out, um, and to get used to them even before we ran out of, uh, out of IPv4. And to some extent that worked, although the, the policy, to be specific, when it was introduced, it was um, 
it was timed so that it would drop the needs-based requirement at the time that APNIC ran out of IPv4. So we actually went through a period, we ran out of IPv4, we then had this uh, transfer policy in action that was not needs-based. It was, if you like, a free market transfer policy. Now, that was fine. Um, it works uh, either way, to be honest. But what, we've, what we then found was that in trying to establish an inter-regional transfer policy, we were unable to do that with ARIN because of the ARIN community's decision that they would not release address space for transfer into a, a policy system which was not compatible and, and needs-based. We had a lot of debate about that, but what it came down to in the community, I think, was a pragmatic decision that said, well, Aaron is pretty firm on this, on this policy. Uh, we are sort of sitting here in, in expectation of, a, of being able to receive transfers from the Aaron region where there's a lot of legacy addresses that may be um, liberated by a transfer policy. And in fact, the reimposing the needs-based uh, components of our policy was not a, a showstopper if you like. It's not, it's not that uh, that creates any um, impediment that our, um, our membership, our community is not used to. It's the same needs-based policy as they were used to for the last 10 years. Um, so it's a long, that's a, a long way of saying we had a free market, if you like, transfer policy. We have reimposed the needs-based policy in order to allow transfers with Aaron. What worries me about the uh, right communities policy is the potential to reverse again the, the discussion back to a dispute with Aaron, the, which is the source of most of the uh, legacy addresses that could be transferred, uh, again declining to enter into a um, into interregional transfers with the RIPE region, possibly even having some compatibility issues about about multiple transfers around the around the world from one <laughs> policy system to the next, it uh, it does uh, concern me that we we're, we're entering into more complexity and and not uh, more convergence and uh, simplicity in the in the, the, the overall global system. I, I, actually, keep your microphone on because I I will just ask a quick follow up. There are five regional internet registries um, that operate and support their members around the world. And they aren't all equal, uh, both in size, in, in, in policy, and the like. Is it OK that they're different? They have different members. I, uh, that's how I see it from the outside. But is it OK that they have different mindsets? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And if, if you like, the, the, RIRs take, uh, the RIR communities take a close uh, eye on each other to look at how the, the policy systems move along in parallel with uh, policy changes often happening here and then later here, or, or vice versa. And there's a, there's a lot of exchange of experience and, and observation, but um, this is a point of, of departure, which would be uh, OK. I mean, it, it, it has to be OK. It's a bottom-up process. But, uh, but what concerns me is that the inter-regional transfers is a point at which a level of compatibility is required, um, at least by one party, uh, who we kind of are relying on for, for pragmatic reasons. Now we can we can argue about the economics and the models and the the effects of one versus the other, but we've got an internet <laughs> to uh, to keep running in the meantime. And so I think that the pragmatic uh, response is the one that ran it one over in um, in the AP Nick case. And I'd like to see that a shared approach, okay. uh, to be honest, frankly. Understand, and that's a great comments um, uh, both for the audience and for discussion. Um, I know that I, I don't really have to ask this question without knowing, but transfers do occur within the APNIC region today, within the region, and they do transfer successfully. Um, RIPE also um, and other RIRs have, uh, within each, each region, have got, uh, have got that uh, capability. Um, the floor is open um, for questions, and I'm seeing, um, um, yeah, I'm going to go from the back first. The, the, um, um, then Elvis, then Woody, um, anybody else um, in the front? Okay. Do you have a microphone in the back? Or can you just grab one of the... Uh, the um... And of course, uh, name and affiliation, please. Um, 
Hi, good morning. My name is Subhi Chaturvedi and I'm a professor from India. I teach at a women's college uh, at Delhi University and we run a foundation called Media for Change which works with women and youth in India. Um, the next billion would probably come online from countries such as uh, India and uh, emerging economies, developing countries. Both IPV4 and 6 are crucial to our integration. We also understand the internet as a finite critical resource. Um, Paul, my question is to you. Um, this is a region which is as diverse as you can imagine in terms of a classic case study, multilingualism, multiple ethnicities, languages and governments which are just trying to come to terms with the power that the internet holds and the possibilities that it um, possesses. My, um, I, I do want to understand as, as an organization that is putting together such diverse viewpoints in terms of obstacles, there are many, what is it that we can do as a registry and as groups that represent different points of views to do more advocacy when it comes to deployment because we have seen this empower villages and change stories. As a matter of fact, we have the next session right here starting at 11 which will an a government of India session that is going to try and talk about the problems and the solutions that we're posing to the world. But I do want to understand what is it that we can do as a region because we can make a difference at this point in history. Thank you. That's a very big, um, a very big question. Um, even even if we started talking about advocacy for IPv6 and and so forth, that would also be a very big question. But I will uh, pull it uh, pull it back to the the subject of the of the meeting, which is that no matter how much advocacy we do for IPv6 in this in this region, uh, we will always have uh, a regional and unconnected IPv6 network if the rest of the world doesn't move with us. And I have to say, one of the uh, eventual effects of an IPv4 transfer market is to redistribute the motivation towards IPv6, which only comes when addresses, frankly, are in short supply, and to encourage the rest of the world, which currently has more IPv6 than needed in some cases, to help to redistribute that motivation so that we can all move towards IPv6 together. And so. I would argue that there's a strong link between an effective V4 transfer market and in fact, uh, the brokers will love to hear this, uh, getting to the stage where V4 addresses are worth zero um, because we've all moved uh, in, a, in a coherent, uh, parallel way effectively to IPv6. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, starting the first question with the phrase, the next billion is a non-trivial question to ask. Um, Peter, you, you're remote, um, and I hope you've been following. Could you maybe um, come a comment on this? Because this truly is, uh, um, truly is in, in, in a way, your space. Uh, there's, a, there's a billion people coming online. What do you have to say? Well, it's a great question. Um, but we don't look at numbers anymore. We look at cyberspace as saying, we used to be when you had a cyber 16 slash 16, oh, it's 65,536 numbers. But through address sharing tools and techniques, which cause some people to cringe, it doesn't make me cringe at all, uh, efficiencies are gained. We're seeing on average that most of the network operators that use a CIDR 16 are supporting a half a million to a million monthly accounts. The, the issue you have to start saying to yourself is, is that, that you've, been, you've been misled to think that there's well, 4.3 billion numbers that can only support 4.3 billion people, that's not how the internet works. And when people start looking at numbers as a one-to-one -one ratio, they're, they're absolutely not understanding how the internet's designed. Um, I, I have uh, many children in my house, and we have 31 internet-connected devices. And we have a single number that we get from a uh, address system, and those numbers are very fungible. So when you look at the next billion people, you can add the next billion people quite easily if you just redesign how you do things, which is much cheaper than swapping out everything. So we're proponents of a system that works. We believe that the next billion people can be brought online without having to force the people that have large number blocks and have no interest at all in updating they, that's what you have to realize is that if I have a pool of numbers and all my customers are happy, 
I have no business reason to change, none. And, and that is for huge swaths of, of, of the world. So there is no business case to upgrade into a different system. And that's probably what has to be realized, is that this is a business case. This is not the technical and policy arena. Each network operator has to make a business case. And that's probably the answer you don't want to hear. This is simply business. And that, unfortunately, is the reality of how we work at things. We look purely from the market. We do not make subjective decisions. We don't say this player is better than that player. We let them determine it based on economics and business sense. Peter, thank you. Um, that was um, uh, both transcribed and, uh, and heard well. Um, my next question from the audience was um, in the middle. Elvis, you have the mic. And if you can give your affiliation, etc. Sure. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, Elvis Vela, I'm working also for one of the brokers uh, in the internet world. Um, I'm working for V4 Escrow. Uh, we're a newly created broker and um, a broker that tries to recycle uh, IPv4 and uh, promote IPv6 as much as possible. Um, this discussion has been uh, really um, interesting, and I do have a few comments. Uh, let me just get them here. Uh, first of all, um, while we all agree that IPv6 is the way forward, uh, we do need to realize that only 2% of the world is currently using IPv6 and connected over IPv6. And there is still enough room to grow the IPv4 internet while IPv6 starts up. Because um, we have seen a lot of development over IPv6 in the past year or two years. Um, but still, uh, a huge amount of users of the Internet uh, are not connected and cannot use IPv6. For the past three or four years, I've been asking my Internet service provider at home, uh, when will you be able to offer IPv6 for my home connection? And every single year, his answer has been, next year and next year. And while most of the content providers have managed to, uh, over, to offer their content over IPv6, I think the biggest step that needs to be made is um, that ISPs can also start connecting end users over IPv6. Um, I, uh, I, I would like to also pose a, cost, a question to the panel. And although I would like to ask all the five RIRs what their opinion is on this, I think um, we should maybe limit it to uh, two types of RIRs. The ones that have uh, finished their um, available free pool and the ones that still have it. And the question would be, um, right now we do have inter-RIR transfers between ARIN and APNIC, and these do work. Uh, they're not too many, but they, they do exist and work. Um, while the RIPE NCC is coming with a new uh, approach to the, to the transfer market, um, would the RIRs that still have plenty of addresses, and I'm talking about, uh, about LACNIC and uh, APNIC here, and uh, will, would these see um, a global policy as the way forward in a global market, actually? And um, the same questions to the to the RIRs that still that no longer um, have a free pool. Would a global policy proposal um, be able to make this uh, this this market work? Okay, uh, Andreas, do you want to um, do you want to talk from the point of view of, of having space? Yes, um, I, I was about to respond the the question, but. Um, further comment regarding the uh, previous speaker and uh, his comments regarding the nature of this phenomenon. And he said uh, this was business and this was what it is. And uh, that brought me to your original question about if there was uh, something to consider about the differences on, on the DNA or the philosophy or the a different perspective from the different areas and fr from the LACNIC perspective, for example, uh, we are an uh, internet address registry, but most of that, more, more than that, uh, our mission, our core values as an organization are 
we are an organization that promotes the, the development of an open internet and a secure, stable internet to our region. And we deal with our work as ARIAR in order to go to promote the goal of uh, being a factor in the development of the network in the region. So with this perspective, we work, for example, with the public sector sectors and our members uh, taking in consideration not only not only the market needs but the development needs, and uh, not only the next billion users that in our region would be like in two years uh, we will have 80 new million uh, users, but also the new uh, dispositives that will be connected and the needs uh, of uh, new type of interactions, new, new type of uh, ways of dealing with technology and new demands from the market, but also the developing uh, needs. For example, in our region, uh, the, the current consensus right now, uh, political with governments, is that uh, every country, every single government should have and does have, they, they do have, even the less developed governments as uh, the Central American government, they, they have a broadband plan and they have uh, measures uh, that they want to develop and LACNIC is working together with the governments in order to de deploy the broadband plans and IPv6 is one part of that strategy. It's one part of the strategy. We, we were working with the ITU, we were working with the CTEL, the, the Americas region for the OES. We are working with uh, other governmental sub-regional governmental organizations and individual governments and we are working with our members in order to promote development and in order to uh, grow, the mar to make the, the market grow, but not uh, to, satisfy, to satisfy just the business need, you know. And so, so this uh, should be, uh, first of all, this is a philosophical difference between maybe different regions and different, uh, um, so also areas could be. But also, uh, to in response of the of the question, um, the the region does not demand at the moment. Uh, a policy, uh, there are discussions, but th there is not a, a focus in demanding a policy of inter ARR transfers. But there is a lot of demand, for example, in, in enable, uh, for especially in, in the part of the members that are, that are active in our community. And there is a lot of demand for them in order to deploy IPv6 in the final user. So, uh, yeah, okay, the, the percentage is 2% not of the world, but 2% of the traffic, which doesn't mean because that, that is 2% of the world because um, many of them, more than 75% in our, in our region, we have less than 2% of traffic. In, in our region is more uh, near to one, so we are behind in IPv6, but 66% uh, or more of, our, of the members have uh, IPv6 allocated. We have a lot of efforts in training their abilities, the operators' abilities and the regulators' abilities in order to deploy IPv6. So this is like a more a, a stair and there are many steps that have been already uh, done. So maybe uh, this could be a dramatic deployment in the future. We're confident that we can achieve that and, and this is mo much more our focus. I wanted to emphasize that uh, our focus is much more in, in promoting development and pro in promoting uh, deploying IPv6 than in uh, resolving some market needs that, that could be in the future we can the, the community should de decide which policies should apply but this is not the focus as okay. I mentioned before thank you very okay. much um, <clears throat> the, um, the transcript missed uh, one key word you said you talked about the philosophical difference between uh, the business uh, that was talked about by, by, by Peter and, um, uh, and, and your RIR. And that's completely understandable. Many different players come to the table with inside uh, uh, this environment. Um, I had Bill. Um, I'm running out of time here, guys, but make it quick. Uh, I've got one at the front, and then John will be your final uh, question from the floor. Bill Woodcock, PCH. This is a question directed to uh, both Anne Rochelle and Peter, um, it's a pretty simple question. Isn't it a bit late in the course of history for Europe to be mining Africa for resources? A quick response, Anne. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Peter, if you heard the question, I'm going to give you a quick time to respond as well. Yeah, we don't, we don't even look at that. That's kind of a... That's kind of an insulting discussion point. Uh, now, we have European companies that have 
large holdings of IP numbers that sell to European operators. We never looked at Africa once, and I think that's kind of a pejorative way of looking at things, kind of insulting. All right, the next question. At the front, and uh, name and affiliation, of course. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Martin, I'm Nabi Ibnama from Morocco. I'm a computer science uh, professor in the university, and I'm uh, participating in IGF as uh, ISOC ambassador. Uh, my question is uh, to my dear Anne, Rachel. So, uh, uh, from your perspective, who are the, 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 the African countries that are most implicated in IPv6 development actually, and uh, what could be the best approach for quick IPv6 uh, migration in the region, taking into account that it can be a multi-stakeholder approach. And as an IPv6 trainer, I have uh, experienced that uh, even if we uh, make lots of uh, IPv6 training courses and workshops, there's still uh, some uh, it take time to, uh, uh, to 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 get a pressure uh, uh, for uh, to uh, the operators, and the uh, the operators actually don't uh, flow as quick as possible. So what can what more can be done for quick migration in the region? And my last question is uh, why the universities are requesting more IPv4 space uh, address. Or uh, from Afrinic, rather than uh, trying to move it forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sabil, and uh, great to see you here. So, um, some of the things that we've been doing to, um, you know, as Andrew said, one of the things that Afrinic also does is really look at the development perspective in our region. So, lots of trainings. One of the things that we're doing right now that we're considering is, for example, starting tracks in universities, you know, on both IPv4 and IPv6, just, be just because we realize that, uh, you know, it it's definitely, you know, we have a space where um, networks are growing. We're lacking the human resource to basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, manage those networks. Uh, we got to need those. So going into universities and uh, having tracks that uh, uh, teach that are some, is something that we're doing. Is um, we also um, we also have uh, online labs right now that people can use. Uh, we do uh, trainings, as I said, this year. For example, we're going into 17 African countries. We've been to about, uh, right now, uh, 49 countries in the region so far, and we've trained about, uh, uh, I think, almost close to 3,000 engineers, you know, in both V4 and V6. So um, training, training, training is really our motto to get, you know, people to realize that, okay, uh, uh, V4 is here, uh, V4 might be lasting, but, you know, to grow the networks and uh, for others who will come, you know, we need to also espouse IPv6. That's what we're doing. And as I said, one of the things that we have seen lately is that governments, you know, are the ones who are coming forward asking for help to actually uh, go uh, dual stack you know, and uh, start using IPv6. So we're hoping that also the fact that, you know, they're coming in there and showing the example in a region where basically governments are pervasive and uh, all over the place, that that can help us, you know, uh, in terms of um, uh, 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 the uptake of IPv6. And um, uh, for the question about universities wanting more space, uh, it's really a bunch of uh, people from the university world who came with this proposal. You know, um, when you look at it, the ones that are the, um, the universities that are in the southern region, so mostly, uh, you know, South Africa, Uganda, and others are some of the ones that are the biggest ones who have the most space. But others in the region don't really have that space. Even though they did espouse internet early, you know, most of them are behind that in general. You know, so um, instead of 
th this discussion really came in parallel with the other one where others are saying, why don't we just give, you know, sell the space? And others said, instead of selling it, why don't we just, you know, put together a policy that would say, uh, you know, give the space to universities. Uh, meantime, though, you know, the issue is, as we just said here, 98% um, of the networks are still, you know, under uh, V4. And uh, uh, looking at the development perspective, some of the discussions that we're having with the community is just simply that, look, in any case, anybody coming now on the networks need, you know, V4 to start business. Or, or there is no business case. This is what they're all saying. So um, in, this is for the community to decide. So universities or some people have been proponents that university takes the space instead of giving it away. And others are saying, no, we need to keep it and just you know, uh, uh, go the regular route of giving it out on needs based and all of that. So it's, it's really up and please join the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the final question, um, and I then will we'll literally we'll do a tiny uh, uh, summary, and then we've got a coffee break and got to get out of this room. Uh, name and affiliation, please. Uh, John Curran, President and CEO of Aaron. I actually don't have a question. I was going to respond to something you said earlier, but if you're short on time, I will defer. Go ahead. Oh. Okay. Very quickly, you you asked the question. Is it okay that we have five registries? Uh, you know, should we should we have one registry? And I just want to be different. Sorry. Right. I just want to point out we actually have one registry. It's one pool of numbers that has to be unique, regardless of whether any given address block is in one RIR or the other. Collectively, it has to only be in one. It's at an RIR or it's at the IANA, and there's coordination to make that happen. The other thing I want to point out is that actually there's some strengths in the current system, completely independent of operations. We're here at the Internet Governance Forum and we're talking about empowerment and we're talking about uh, being able to have involvement in policy development. The global policy mechanism of the RIRs mean that policies are discussed around the globe in local meetings with organizations that people know and trust and that those policies actually have to converge in five regions to become global policy. And so I want to point out the strength of our system is we actually have a system that has a lot of engagement and a lot of discussion. And yes, that does mean it's hard to get consensus sometimes, but it means not that one party dominates the conversation over another. It means it gets discussed again and party and individual groups move from side to side and it converges slowly based on what is really uh, empower multi-stakeholder empowerment. So I don't want to lose the fact that the policy development process of the IR system is probably one of the few things we know that is working exceptionally well in this model. Yes, and if anybody wants to uh, join in any of the regions, the uh, the whole process, the policy development uh, uh, process is normally um, email-based uh, plus meetings and um, as somebody who has attended many of them, uh, lively events. Now, it is essentially coffee time. I know that it's other people who have got places to go, but you were very diligent with your hand up, so um, you have... 30 seconds for a question and maybe less for an answer, and then we break for coffee. All right. I'm Vikram Tivarkar from the Cellular Operators Association in India, and we've got about 900 subscribers. Uh, quick question is that the challenge in V6 from a customer demand point of view, while the large enterprises are okay, but the SMEs, uh, the small and medium enterprises, you know, their willingness or eagerness to ask for V6, so any experience or and anything that you could share with them. Who wants to take the 30 second answer? I'll take that. Um, the, uh, there is a huge long tail with IPv6 deployment. Uh, some networks who have switched on IPv6 have seen immediately 50% uh, uh, um, IPv6 usage on their networks uh, overnight. Um, this is misleading because uh, it's from the top 10 providers. Um, and once you go past that, the deployment of IPv6 is very thin indeed. Uh, I don't know how we can fix this other than huge amounts of uh, work and elbow grease and education. Okay. Um, 
I want to thank the panel, um, and um, I think this has been a, a, a good, lively deba debate, lots of information. Uh, I apologize for it running late, uh, but no one actually came into the room to kick us out, so that was good. Um, and a round of applause, and thank everybody. Thank you. Martin, can I, can I point out one thing, which is off the agenda but pertinent to the last question, which is that um, many of you will be using IPv6 right now. It's on the network, it's available, it's running. So uh, user demand might not be there, but it works, and uh, there it is. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody.